Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, new Sony Hall. Isn't this uh, beautiful, this place? It's amazing looking. It's incredible. Anyways, I'm Brad Talinsky with uh, Backstory Events. And tonight's show is going to be live streamed uh, on guitarworld.com. Uh, it'll be up there if you guys love what you see and you want to go re relive it. It's going to be uh, on guitarworld.com. And uh, I don't know, I, I recognize a few of these faces out here before. You may know that uh, this is part of a larger series. Uh, we do uh, have a regular interview series that we do. And if you want to know more and, uh, you know, want to see who we're going to be talking to in the future, go to BackstoryEvents.com. So. <laughs> so, uh, with 11 number one rock singles. I mean, think about that, 11 number one rock singles. That's like ridiculous. And uh, they've got a brand new record, uh, w which I've heard coming out in May, and tonight you're gonna hear some songs from it, which is gonna be awesome. And it's a fantastic record, super ambitious. Um, these guys are one of the biggest rock bands on the planet. Tonight we're gonna discuss with them about uh, the new album, uh, the future, and uh, then they're going to play a little bit. Uh, so without uh, any further hesitation, uh, let's start the conversation and bring out Shinedown. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. New York City! Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> What's going on, guys and girls? Hey, seriously, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're super excited to be here. Thank you so much for being here. Love you back. Say hello to Brad, everyone. everyone say, say hi, hi to, Brad. to Brad, everyone. <laughs> so, so anyways, let's, uh, let's start right at the top. Let's talk about... Uh, the significance of the title of this record, Attention, Attention. I thought, well, you know, is this a signal to your fans and people at large that this is uh, something special? You know, you really want to just grab them? Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why um, when we talked about the artwork for the record, the exclamation point was, uh, it was a big deal. Yeah, you got to flip it around. Yeah. <laughs> It was the Incredibles logo before that. It's it real. was the Incredibles logo before that. <laughs> I didn't say I was smart. We're all musicians. I mean, come yes. on. We didn't get here by being smart. None of us. No, it, um, because, the, because the, dy the dynamic of the album, uh, it's the first record that we've done uh, that is a story album. Um, a lot for us, for this particular record, was about impact and about making a statement. In, uh, we feel like this record is very necessary right now. We also feel like it's a, a very urgent sound that's not been heard in quite some time. Um, that was the dynamic, too, by calling it attention, attention, and putting the, the exclamation point, and designing an exclamation point that when you saw it, you knew exactly what it represented. Um, Marco Bresky uh, is actually who came up with the, uh, with the exclamation point. Um, through, I remember when Zach said, we should call the album Attention, Attention. Uh, there's a song on the album called that, but when we were looking at different names for what the record could have been, we kind of got into that zone of, it was just too much, and we wanted to have the impact of less is more. And uh, to be honest with you, um, it's really one of the, the coolest album covers I think we've ever come up with. Yeah, we actually toyed around with some other album titles that were like long and extended, almost like a storybook title or something. It we even cool. almost went self-titled. We did. We we because we don't have a self-titled album. Yeah, we thought about just calling it Shine Down because it's so autobiographical. It's about our lives over the past two and a half years, and it's it's all laid out there. So that would have made sense, but we didn't do that. Now so. it's called Attention, Attention. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was I was really uh, caught by the album's graphics too. I thought it was. It's so simple, but it has a lot of different meanings. And, and one is, it it's just must be hard, even with guys that have had your track record and your success, 
to really cut through the social media to, to get people's attention, to get them looking away from their cell phones a little bit, right? I think that you have to take an initiative, or at least the four of us took the initiative to understand that the album is really about not being afraid to fail. I think that sometimes people will pigeonhole themselves a bit and almost put themselves into a corner when they want something different for their life, no matter what it is, and they're looking for not so much a greater purpose, but they're looking for what's next for them. And sometimes, because they've never attempted certain things, they're afraid to try. The fact of the matter is, you're gonna need to fail. You're gonna have to. Um, that's the only way you're gonna get better. And a lot of that is, is built in this record because we don't think that you're gonna be defined by your failures. We think you'll be defined by the fact that you didn't give up. I think, too, for us, that, uh, your first standing ovation of the night, Mr. Smith. <laughs> for the first of many, we're sure. <laughs> I think for us, too, it was about the social media thing. I think that we've always kind of, we ha always kind of had this slow rise with social media to where the, the people who have four million followers overnight are gone in six weeks. You know, and for us, it, it was always kind of this slow build. So cutting through it is always kind of be us being ourselves and kind of standing out amongst the crowd with, with being ourselves and not trying to be weird. And but we also did something pretty specific on, you know, just for Shine Down as a whole. We kind of, I think the four of us looked at each other and we realized how important that reach can be if you really pay attention to your social media and what's going on in the world. We hired this amazing young lady named Morgan Townsend. Who's here. Who's here tonight. She's and right. she's actually the head of our digital strategy. <laughs> alongside she's Allison, alongside Allison and Liam from our management, Indigoot and McGaffey Promotions, they're here tonight as well. <laughs> Leah Piscicani from Atlantic Records is here tonight, head of rock. Chris Brown, our product manager, is here as well. Carla, Clap for our press, everyone. our pub our publicist, Carla's here tonight. We got a lot of people in the house. I, I actually want to touch on something Brent said earlier, and I'm going to take it back serious again. But he, and he's talking about not being afraid to fail. And this record exists because we failed. We failed each other in a lot of ways and, and uh, went through a lot of hard times and fell, fell on our faces and... and uh, you know, we're lucky to be here in a lot of ways, and that's why this is here. So I think the fact, you know, what he, what he was saying about, you know, the greatest things can come out of failure. And, um, you know, I, Isn't that also part of, like, being an artist? Isn't it, isn't it always, like, a little bit scary to, to embark upon a new project or a new record? I mean, you have to Absolutely. really put yourself out there. I was nervous. 15 seconds ago yeah. before we walked out here. <laughs> I would do. be He's worried we, if yeah. I wasn't nervous before we walked out on stage. I still get like crazy butterflies. Doesn't matter if it's in front of five people or if we're in front of 500,000 because we played for both. And if you're not nervous, something's wrong. It lets you know you're alive. You know, don't run from that. It'll, it'll be there for you when you need it. Do you ever get uh, worried about topping yourself or making the next record better, that kind of stuff? <laughs> I just told uh, I just told Liam backstage. Uh, he w this is the first time we've seen this vinyl actually today. It was the first time we we laid eyes on it, and I'm holding it, and I started to have anxiety about the fact that we're gonna have to start making another one at some point. And this one's not even out yet. So, by the way, for those of you who don't know this already, the gentleman to my right over here is the producer of this record and the mixer of this album. We're gonna get way deep into that a little bit later on. But I uh, also wanna just set up this record for, for everybody out there that's looking at us in the stream, people in the audience here. This is kind of a concept record, right? Like, I, I listened to it and I, I saw it's more like a, almost a psychological concept or, or journey. It is. Um, the whole album actually takes place inside of a room. How many people have seen the Devil video? And so, how many people have seen the Human Radio video? So, if you notice in the audio, there's kind of like this machine at the beginning kind of going on. It kind of has a, a bit of a heartbeat. So that's the way that the album starts off. And then you hear a knock at the door. You hear the door open up. You, you can hear this person walk um, into this 
room, the environment kind of changes. You hear this chair get pulled up, person sits down, takes a deep breath, exhale, and then devil starts. So we wanted the listener to be able to put themselves inside the chair in the room. Because another part of this record um, is that it is a story. Um, and the goal is to not only sonically, but visually tell the story. So we're going to be doing a video for every song on the album to tell the story. That. So the significance, if you go back and you look at the Devil video and you look at the Human Radio video, because those are the ones that are out right now, you're going to see a couple of frames where you'll see that chair by itself. Um, there's a lot of symbolism that, that goes into this. Um, I don't want to continue the full thought, I guess, because I, I think about when me and Eric and Zach and Barry, we were all kind of looking at each other, and when we were deciding that, Let's make a record that tells a story, but don't do it in like the quintessential concept record way. Concept records I think of are like Pink Floyd's The Wall or Tommy's, or, you know, when the Who did Tommy or, or even Queensryche's Operation Mindcrime, which is a killer record. Yeah. There's a lot of like really specific things in those albums and this was, it's, it's a lot more broad, but we want to take you on a journey. We want to take you on a ride, physically, mentally, psychologically, even spiritually. Um, it's, it literally is, the record has no boundaries. We, we really didn't know we were making a story record until we were, we'd written quite a few songs, and they all started having this thread of, of what's been going on in our lives and dealing with our own personal demons, and, and uh, each one of us have different ways we try to destroy ourselves when we're not touring. <laughs> Lots, so lots of ways. So uh, it, it kind of it kind of hit us in the head a little bit where it was like, wait a minute, you know, it, it's uh, yeah, we, we we had written this one particular song and and it was like, oh, this is really personal. It's okay now to write about all these other things that have happened and kind of make a chronological story out of them. So out of the gate, there wasn't this intention to write a, a story record, but it just sort of uh, it wanted to happen and it wouldn't let us not do that. Doesn't that sort of uh, help open you up to, to uh, you know, to maybe some of those darker aspects? Because you can do it in the guise of a story, and, and in some ways it's a device that you may feel a little bit more comfortable about writing something personal because it's within the concept of a you uh, know, fictional story. Maybe, I don't think in this instance that was it. I don't think it was about making it safe. I think on this record, it was the opposite of that. This record, it was okay to just say, this is what this is. This is about us. This is, and it, the thing is, we, it's put into a form where all of you will be able to take things out of these songs and apply them to your life or apply them to some experience you're going through. So it's not this, you know, uber personal thing where we're calling each other by name or anything. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's still very, uh, very much a rock record and and very much a, a shine down record in that way. But uh, it was sort of the opposite. Whereas previous records we've written about personal things, but we kind of packaged them into something else or or. Even even if it was after the fact, we sort of turned them in a different direction. And on this record, it was, uh, I mean, I remember Brent and I having this conversation about, you know, are we, are we going to talk about this when this comes out? I mean, are we going to really say this is what this is about? Are we going to address these issues and, and talk about them? And we had a very lengthy conversation about that. And uh, in the end, we thought it was best to be to be honest with everyone. And, and uh, we thought it would make the record more impactful. We talked about it earlier, too, like in, in, in previous records, like, we would hide stuff in ambiguity and kind of and kind of tuck it in somewhere into a story to where you, it is about you, but maybe you don't want to be so so forward and say it's about you because you're kind of hiding it in a bit. And this record is just so plainly put that it is about the four of us. And uh, I think we're letting people into kind of our lives more so than we ever have before. Especially even on a record like Sound of Madness, we would we would kind of tether things into a thread of of a bigger picture. And this is this is blatantly about the four of us at different times in our lives. Well, what I did notice is that the arc of the record, it ends on a super uplifting, redemptive note. But still cautionary, though. Yeah. Well, I just wondered if, if you guys are in a better place well, in your we lives oh, yeah. now. We, we totally are in a, in a better place. But the, the thing is, is, is going into the story, we were in a great place as well. And we were probably, we were a machine, you know, yeah. and, and uh, it was on the Amaryllis tour. And, and when we came off of touring that record, we ran everything right into a wall and, and spent the entire last Threat to Survival album cycle fixing ourselves. 
and you end up with attention, attention. So, uh, um, and I'll be very, very upfront about this as well. Um, like you said, um, when we finished the album cycle for Amaryllis, um, thank you. Um, there's <laughs> such an awesome energy in this room, I love it. Um, all right. <laughs> we know Zach's the cute one, we get it. <laughs> but the interesting thing was, um, coming off of Amaryllis, he makes a very, very good point, Eric. Um, we were just a machine when we came off the road. We were physically in the best shape of our lives. We were 24, 25 months into just playing so many shows and being all over the entire globe that all of a sudden, on the very last show of the cycle, after two and a half years of touring, it stopped. And For two years. For two years. And when, here's the thing, too. We asked for all of this. The only reason that we are on this stage right now is because of every single person in this building. So thank you. Yeah, this, this is... It's not a, a poor me thing or anything. It's not. I mean, we, we, know, we, we know what we signed up for. It's just we, only, we have to tell what we know, you know. And the thing about that was, and, and I'm getting to it, is... I think if anybody knows my history, I'm very, very open about my struggles with alcoholism and drug abuse. And in 2014, I fell because I was in such a focused place that when it completely stopped, I didn't know what to do. And, you know, I, I kind of fell from grace. And then, Fast forwarding into the making and the writing of the, the record Threat to Survival, there's a reason that record was called Threat to Survival. And during that journey, it was, it was a rebuilding for all four of us. But the three gentlemen that I'm with, and I'm with them more than anyone, they never looked at me and they, were, they never judged me. Like, they were never, like, looking at me and they're like, I can't believe you screwed up again. That never happened. Like, they never looked at me and said, look, you know, we just don't think that this is going to be able to continue. And there wasn't that. They were just there for me. Eric left Charleston, South Carolina, and didn't tell me and showed up in Los Angeles at my house. And he took me to the Cleveland Clinic for two weeks to help me try to get my head straight. And, you know, and then moving forward in, in a lot of this, it was that whole touring cycle was rebuilding, not only um, just for me personally, physically, I had to do a lot of work to, like, regain not only my physical but my mental focus. Um, and I just remember we started to get that, we started to get that machine again but we started to get that machine with a really strong heartbeat and at the end of 2016 we were finishing up the touring cycle for threat and we were actually on the road uh, with another band and in November and December we were kind of finishing off that cycle and Eric was like and the the last part of November and December this is at the end of 2016 he goes I'm just gonna bring a small Pro Tools rig out and on the show days, I'm just going to find a room in the arena and just work on some new material. By the time we finished that tour, that was about two months long, he had 22 compositions. They didn't have any lyrics or any uh, vocals or melodies to it, but he had all of these, um, these great pieces of music. So when I finally listened to him in January of last year, that's kind of where the, the idea of We've never done a concept record or a record that tells a story. Let's do something different. But that's really like where it all kind of sparked from. So you went through all sorts of transformations and even sort of a physical one. Like you were like, looked like a serious goth dude for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't I trade I, it, man. It no. got me to where I am. I, 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 
I mean, I, I dig the new, the new look, but did you? I love my inner Robert Kathy Smith. Kathy Lee Gifford inspired all of this, actually, I think. <laughs> but, but, but did you feel that that inner transformation sort of manifested itself into something, I'm not going to say more wholesome, but, you know, like a different look? Did you want to look different? I don't know. I mean, I just kind of, you know what? I'll be straight up with you. Eric and Zach and Barry, it goes back to that moment a second ago. They've never judged me, and I don't judge them either. We just support each other. And, uh, you know, for me, I just was in a place where I don't, you know, I, I guess in the last couple of years, you know, certain people have said that I've kind of turned into a little bit of a chameleon, but I'm always going to be Brent Stephen Smith from Knoxville, Tennessee. <laughs> well, singers and I'm are, proud of that. Singers are supposed to do that stuff anyways, you know. Um, I'm, I'm 100% authentic, and I am totally cool with who I am. Oh, so uh, Eric. <laughs> we love you, Brent. Love you back. Oh. You are. You all right. Thank you. You're all right. So, uh, Eric, you uh, you produced uh, this record, and I want to yes. yes. Producing us isn't easy, so clap for that. Did, did that change the way you guys work together in the studio at all? I mean, No, I had produced tracks previously. I produced Cut the Cord. I produced Diamond Eyes. Um, some other, you know, a song called I'm Alive that was on the Avengers soundtrack and some other things. So it wasn't... Also, her name is Alice. He did that as well. <laughs> it, wa it wasn't uncharted territory, but uh, I was... Pretty app I wouldn't say pretty apprehensive. I was a little apprehensive about doing it because I'm a firm believer that a band benefits greatly from a great producer. And, and if you, not that I'm not a, a good producer, but you lose that outside opinion, especially when you've written the demo, produced the demo, then recorded and you know, tried to produce the song and, and trying to have that, that, that um, you know, outside perspective that, that will really, can really help a song if it's needed. But, um, I thought that I really had a, a scope for what this record wanted to be. Um, it's, I mean, you can say it's, it's uh, Pollyanna or whatever to say this, but, but music records have a, a heartbeat and they have a soul and songs, a collection of songs will let you know. I'd rather go crazy making this record than, you know, go crazy watching someone else try to make it. And uh, I did go crazy, by the way. I remember, uh, I remember sitting on a bus and we were in Montana. I'll never forget this. And it was almost like the three of us were trying to convince him that he had to produce the record. Because he's very, he's the, one of the most humble people you'll ever meet as far as his talent goes. And he is by far the most talented person in our band. Um, uh, it's true. Or something. <laughs> or something. He might, he might not necessarily 100% agree with this, what I'm getting ready to say, but it, it really is true because I watched it. Um, he never walked in any day and didn't know exactly what he was going to do on that day. Like, when he walked in, he never had that look of, like, what have I gotten myself into? He knew very, very specifically what that day was going to bring. And as the record, um, as we got deeper into the album, if there were days where he knew that he might be just a little too burned out or he's not slept enough or, or what have you, he consciously would look at me and look at Zach and look at Barry and he'd go, let's get out of here for a minute. And then we'd, we'd go and we'd do something else and we might come back to the studio or we might start again the next day. Um, that's the sign of a true leader and also a sign of a real producer because by him showing everybody involved that he, he had total control of the situation and he was going to guide everybody in the direction that they needed to go. And that's what he did every single day. And he kept it positive. He, it was intense, but it was meant to be intense. But we also laughed a lot as well because we're around I'm each intense. other. Yeah. You, yes. Really? Yes. Yeah. You did. No, not you. I, also, it was like, I think the biggest worry when you, when you self-produce is that 
you know, you're not going to be able to police yourselves. You're going to turn into a spaceship and fly off. Somewhere. Exactly. You're going to you're going to you're going to make a record that you want to make and then no one's going to like it. But no, he he was able to police the record as the producer of the record, but then also be the bass player of the record and be my bandmate and go, hey, I think you should play it this. Also, it should be in time and it should be this chord. Uh, well, I mean, we, we had this conversation on the, on the bus. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Almost. Do it again. I'm not that bad. So, I like to capture a moment. It's just got to be good. I feel like so, I'm at a banquet. You guys clap after everything. This is great. I've never felt so much self-pride when everybody claps like after everything we said. I love it. It's great. No, but, but to, to, to your question, though, uh, these guys allowed me to be the producer and, you know, never questioned anything I was asking them to do. Um, and y honestly, any, any, I think in any other band, there would have been somebody who was butthurt or something, right? You know, <laughs> with one of their bandmates, bandmates telling them how to play their instrument or, or how to perform a certain way. And, and these guys never did that. And um, they, uh, they'd say maybe, are you sure? <laughs> Every once in a while. But, a lot, a lot. but, but would, never, would never completely question anything. And, and to that note, though, I'm I'm very uh, in in any band that I work with as a producer, but especially this band, you know, you have to to admit when you're wrong about something too. And and so I was was always keeping myself in check with what I was doing and making sure I was making the right decisions for these guys. So um, our, it, it was just an extension of our band dynamic as it is now. I mean, we we all love each other. We all get along. We could all ride individual buses, but we don't. We also ride the same bus and watch each other sleep and do crazy. Weird things like that. <laughs> but uh, hold up, what? <laughs> no, we, we, we like each other. Hush. <laughs> no, it's, at this level of success, you know, sometimes, like I said, we could we could easily be on our own buses right now. But we we genuinely like each other. We look forward to after the show getting on the bus and watching Netflix and watching comedy specials and hanging out with each other. And what are you watching on Netflix these days? We can't stop watching Dave Chappelle. We've been watching all a lot Dave, of Dave Chappelle, Chappelle all, all the time. Yeah. See, the good thing about bands watching comedians is all musicians secretly want to be comedians. And That's if you, we true. just, if we just repeat everything Dave Chappelle yeah, says yeah. to each other, we think we're funny. We think we're funny because we repeat things that funny people actually yeah. said. <laughs> but, but I was wondering, Eric, that, did you have a vision, uh, you know, like a sound going into this record that, that you want to do? I did. Uh, and I, I think that in my mind, I probably... 85 to 90 percent captured what I wanted to capture. Um, I think that if I had gone full tilt 100 percent to what I wanted, uh, the record might not be listenable. So um, I really wanted it to sound dangerous. I wanted it to sound urgent. I wanted it to sound like it was going to fly out of the speaker and grab you and strangle you. Um, and I mean that very seriously, actually. But then when they're, when they're the, the tender moments of the record, I wanted to embrace you and, and put you in a blanket and wrap you up and rock you to sleep. So. And I'm, I, hey. What you really did. Look, so, but like with, with, with a song like Devil. There he did, was, he wrapped me up one night in a blanket. It was awesome. It's when I was watching him sleep. Before he sang the and vocal. he watched me sleep for three days. <laughs> Before he sang the vocal on special, Eric actually wrapped him up in a blanket. It was very nice. Yes. It's uh, not true. But, but you know, listen, listen to how, the, the way the devil sounds and, and you know, the, I, I wanted the drums to be distorted. I wanted the vocals to be distorted. I wanted, I wanted it to sound not safe and and this is not a uh, this is not me sitting on high and taking a shot at anybody else but a lot of rock records these days are super clean and and processed and and can sound you know not as dangerous as they could sound and that, and f so for this record because of the subject matter and because of the gravity of that I wanted the music and the production to mirror that so uh, I, but there, there wasn't there was a, an iteration of devil at one point that was over the top distorted almost and and Ted Jensen had to reel you in. <laughs> no, Ted Jensen didn't reel me in, but uh, <laughs> I actually got to re reel myself in a little bit on it and, and realize that, you know, you have to, okay, now, now come back a little bit. You've gone too far. Come back. Um, it, the record is, I mean, it really is gigantic sounding. I was telling somebody who was sort of like listening to, a, a, you know, a preview to a movie in a theater. It's just like, Rah! and uh, each note seems to be, every note is big and has real intention behind it. Um, and I was wondering, Zach, does that, like, that approach affect, like, how you're going to play the guitar? It, it seems really, um, in some ways, 
since every note counts, like you can't be overly busy with your parts and. Well, yeah, I mean it does. We've never tried to be overly busy, but him as a producer, like I said, he he had this sound in mind from the beginning, into where I wasn't in his mind, obviously, and I didn't know what was going on. We approached this as a two guitar player record. Eric played just as much guitar on this record as I did, which I like. And Zach played bass on this. And record. I played bass on this so. record. We do that. We're we're kind of a band that we just kind of swap instruments in the studio. I remember that day though when he when when you all switched well, instruments. That I was mean, cool. Zach would Zach has a, a certain feel that he plays with, and I have a certain feel that I play with. And I felt like it was something where if, if Zach had written the riff and and that was his thing, then he should play it because that's the way it should sound. If I had written the riff, then I should play it because that's how it should sound. Um, and you know we're a band, and and we we really know how to check our egos and leave them at the door. And, yeah. and so and Zach has a certain feel on bass on certain things that I don't have. Um, he's you know so there was a certain pocket that I need for us for a certain piece or for a, for a certain song, and it's something he's familiar with. He should play it. And uh, I mean you know I I, mean, I played some drums on the record, not a song of drums, but drums, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, it just it just depended on where we were at the time, what we needed, what, what needed to happen. I, and, and, you know, nobody has any, any, any fragile egos or anything. And yeah. um, we all actually sang a lot on the record, a lot of background stuff that, that at one point on other records, Brent might have sang a, a ton of background stuff. And he did sing a ton of background stuff, but other parts that, that we all, you know, would, would do harmonies on if, if you know... Just to do something different. Yeah, it's a fun change. Zach played too. piano on the I record. Did. Zach I played, played piano. piano yeah. record. Um, it, you know, and it just there were there was. Give it up for that. <laughs> Everybody, hey, a round I mean, of applause, uh, Mr. Zach Myers uh, my and his mediocre, piano skills. My mediocre at best. I mean, Zach's already, he, he was already a veteran of that. He played all the piano on Thick as Thieves on, oh, on, yeah, I did. on Threat to Survival. Yeah. That was, there that you was go. Zach Myers on to, piano. To right? answer, to to go back to your question, to for me, like uh, notes are. I've never been a flashy player. I'm, I care about songs, songs, and songs. And to me, that's what a record is. It's about the song. So, you know, and, and if I ever would kind of get flashy on something, you have him to kind of pull you back because, you know, I want to do what's best for the song. And if it's, and I think with this record, musically, this is the most powerful lyrical accompaniment to a lyric, I think, of any record, even more so than Sound of Madness, which is, mm -hmm kind of, you know, not necessarily our benchmark, but was our, our catapulting album that kind of brought us into arenas and, and things yeah. like that and brought songs to, you know, all these people tonight. And it's so, for us, when it comes to making a record and making the music on a record, we're going to do what's best for the song, you know, whether it's, you know, a lot of Threats of Survival, and, and there's songs on this record too, are one string, very Jack White, small amp, big sound kind of things. But when you have him behind the console making it happen, it sounds enormous. You know, the, the thing about Devil is that most people don't realize it's a lot of one string playing. There's not, there's not a single chord in that song no. until the bridge where that acoustic guitar plays, but the rest of it is one, one crushing riff after One note, yes. <laughs> one string, you know, leave it to a bass player, right? One, one riff string, to rule you know. them all. <laughs> a big riff. But it, he says not a lot of, but there, there is, we both have actually a lot of cool flashy moments on this record. Yeah, we do. Too, it's, you know? it's really cool. There's a lot of guitar solos on this record again, which is very uh, nice. I, I was going to say that uh, most, uh, most guitar players, when they say that they're playing for the song, it usually means that they really can't play. But Zach, I could tell you, he can, he could, that dude totally rips. This guy which, can play, man. Which is, you know, to me, it's got to be a tough thing to be able to hold back, like when you can when you can play as well as you do to not take a, the big solo in every song. Zach has a very good saying. It's not about the pain. Oh, sorry. What is it's it? not about the painter. It's about the painting. That's what it is. <laughs> it's not about the painter. It's about the painting. I've gotten, you know, to me, to me, accolades for me are band accolades. I don't care about solo accolades whatsoever. And I never have, you know. And, and for me, it's about what can... We, I, what light can I bring to the band and what light can I shine on the band? I don't want to be a guy who stands up there and shreds for 15 minutes. I have the utmost respect for it, but I'm a songwriter and I want, I want the song to be good first. You know, I don't need to, at this point in my career, I don't need to prove anybody that I can play guitar well. But what you don't know is that every day before soundcheck for 15 minutes, he gets on stage <laughs> and shreds. Until we all get up there. What did, you, what did you call it the other day? You had a good name for it the other day. I forgot. What did I call it? The, the Zach Myers Blues Explosion. Yes. The Zach Myers Blues 
Shred explosion happens every day. I'll get on stage and I'll like, I, I was influenced by the blues. Oh, you know that. I was influenced by the blues and I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. So I was a huge blues player. That's a thank you. Yeah, just cl clap for everything. There are three people in here that like <laughs> Memphis. That's great. Yeah, clap for everything. I, I, I could have been like, yeah, Nesbitt, Mississippi. None of you guys have heard that. We'd be like, yeah, Nesbitt. I grew up a blues player. So I grew up, you know, and then I played with B.B. King um, when I was 15. He schooled and, uh, you with one note one time. He, uh, and I read later that he did this to Albert King and Steve Ray Vaughan too, but we were all jamming on stage one night. Um, I forgot where we were, but the three of us kind of, it was me and Kenny Wayne Shepherd, and um, I forgot who the other player was. And we'd all kind of go around. We we're playing The Thrill Is Gone. We'd all play around. And then someone else would go. And I felt really good about myself because I was playing fast. and I was like, oh, this is great. And then BB stopped the band and held one note for 16 bars. And I literally put my guitar down and walked off stage. <laughs> It was kind of that, that homage of, of your, your peers going, it's not about the, the, the amount of notes, it's about the quality and the one note. And if you're going to be taken to school, uh, you know, might as well be by B.B. King. You know, there's, there's worse people to be taken to a school by. <laughs> we, we've been uh, sort of talking a lot about the uh, devil this evening. I was wondering, what does the devil mean to you guys? What does the devil mean to us? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> where do we begin? <laughs> Will Ferrell in the Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah, Fred's got is. slacks with Garth Brooks. That's the devil from the SNL skit. That's what the devil means. Now, um, you know, it's, it's one of those dynamics where I think that you have to... I don't think that you should play it safe, you know, in your livelihood, who you are. I think that you need to be conscious of your surroundings and who you are as an individual, but it's about learning and it's about asking questions and it's about, you know, I've always thought that like, I'm not into asking what if. I'd rather ask why not, you know what I mean? And the devil, however you look at it, that's that energy that's inside of you telling you you can't do it. You're never going to do it. And what you have to learn is you don't have to like that part of you, but you have to respect it. Because if you don't, it'll take over and it'll make you second guess who you are. And I'm telling you, don't ever do that. Stand your ground, be yourself, and I promise you, you'll succeed in everything you do. Hello, Eric. <laughs> no, I mean, what does the devil mean to you? I'm absolutely not as eloquent as Mr. Smith. Uh, but just in the context of the song, um, it, what, what Brent said, I mean, for me, the devil is my depression. It's the thing that keeps me down, the thing that keeps me in the house. Won't let me get out of bed certain days and uh, would kill me if it could. And I've often said to Brent, I wish that that I could reach in my head and grab that thing, whatever it is, and just rip it out and get rid of it. And I think all of us have those things in our lives, those things we wish we could get rid of, those unsavory parts of ourself uh, that are there for whatever reason, whether they're, they're natural or they're, they're self-imposed. But uh, as Brent said, you can't try to ignore it and beat it down. You have to accept it, you have to respect it. And once you do that, um, you can it has keep, no more control. You can keep it from controlling your life. And uh, so for me personally, that's what the devil is. And in the song, you know, we're talking about the devil's in the next room. For me, it's that. For Brent, it's addiction. And for Zach, it's cheeseburgers. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> no, but, it, it, but I, I mean that wholeheartedly. It's um, been a long fight. But. <laughs> but you have to respect it. It's in the next room. It's right there. It's coming to get you if you don't figure out how to deal with it in a respectful way, so. Yeah, for me, I mean, they've, they've, we kind of, we're all of the same ilk and of the same brain and we know what the song's about. And, you know, like you said, it's for, for, for some people it's drugs, for some people it's depression, for some people it's drinking, for some people it's sex addiction, whatever it is, you're, you're, any vice that you have, any addiction, any, any problem that, that plagues your life, it's, it's always right behind you. You know, or it's always close by, and, and it's to me, it's just about changing your mind and changing your the way you look at it. And if you can defeat that, 
then that's you're living your best life in a way in the sense of it's never going to it's never going to be able to wrap you up if you're aware of it and you can kind of fight it. And you also it's about having a support system around you to help you fight it. You know, it's, you know, especially for him and him, you know, they, they deal with these things every day. You know, I've never had a, an issue like that. So for me, other than the cheeseburger thing, but um, <laughs> meat and cheese only. Uh, pickle and mustard now. I added pickle and mustard. <laughs> That's neither here. That doesn't matter. I, I, I sort of want to be a little pro devil here for a moment. Oh, God. <laughs> Can I take right. the. I'm going to take the opposite. No. All right. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the devil in the rock and roll has always had a pretty interesting sort of exchange there. You know, like. The devil can be something that makes you want to have fun and cut loose or rebel, you know. I mean, it has some good aspects to it. Is that it. really the devil, though? I mean, come on, you know. I mean, I think In classic rock it is, yes. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no Christmas with the devil? <laughs> That's, that, that'd be my, I'm, I'm actually going to make a Christmas album called Christmas with the Devil. <laughs> I, I interrupted Brad. Me and you, Brad, ahead. me and you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll uh, ignore my sponsor for a minute and get back to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Human Radio, you know, the other video that you guys put out. And um, first, I thought it was really cool that the star of the video was a woman. Because a lot of times, like hard rock bands such as yourself, it sort of gets typecast as just being for dudes or young guys or, or whatever. And I thought it was an interesting choice that it was sort of a woman that was, um, you know, acting out the, 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 the songs or that, you know, I mean, how do you feel about that? I mean, is, it, you know, female audience has to be able to relate to your lyrics as well. Does that, is that a consideration? I think that it comes down to the, the dynamic that we're not really into rules and we're not into boundaries. So um, it was really important that that part of human radio was we wanted it to be a female. Um, once again, you have to take into consideration we have a bigger vision for the entire album because we are going to be able to tell you the story. So a lot of these individuals that you've seen in the first two videos, you'll see them again in other videos as well because we're... Um, that, that whole dynamic is very important. But it's also about, I'll give you an example too. That day that we did the Human Radio video, uh, we were working uh, with our director, Bill Yukik, and he was like, I'm gonna need like 20, 30 people um, to have these shots on the street. And we were like talking about how we were gonna get extras and, and what have you, because we were in Los Angeles. And we basically, I don't know how many Day, what was it, 72 hours, something like that? Yeah, it was a couple days, yeah. We, all the people that you see in the human radio video, aside from the young lady who is, you know, the main focus in that video, those are all Shinedown fans that came up to Los Angeles. And, uh, Thank you, if anyone's here. Was anybody in the video here? Anyone? I don't know. There might no? be somebody okay. here. I don't know. <laughs> People it, came from all over, though. It was very cool. Yeah, they flew. Like, there were people that flew in from other countries, other cities. And, like, Bill was like, as long as I get 20, 30 people, we'll be good. It's like 170 people that showed up, you know. Yeah. And it was just really, really cool to have that because there were just different kinds of people from all walks of life, you know. But that's what that video and that song is about, too. If you wonder what the human radio is, it's your heartbeat. That's what it is. It's society and humanity, but it's, it's the heartbeat. Play that. And uh, play that. <laughs> the cool thing, too, at the, towards the, the, the finale of that video, because it's by no means, you know, the end of anything, um, there are three cameos from the, from the devil video. The people that are behind her when she's looking at the exclamation point, all three of those people were in the, the devil video as well. You'll catch that the next time you look at it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, man, there's a lot of dynamic in this album. There's a lot of... But, it, it's not one-sided, man. But, but, to your, but to your point, I mean, are we ever thinking about a female audience when we're writing? We're just thinking about humanity. We're thinking about people. Uh, we had a very interesting conversation in the car today about our fan base and how diverse it is. And you, know, you hear people talk about diversity a lot these days. And it's not something we ever bring up because we don't have to, because we see it on a daily basis. And 
you know, I don't, we, we have fans that are transgendered. We have fans that are, that are black. We have fans that are white. We have fans that are pro Second Amendment. We have fans that are, you know, from, from so many different countries. From eight to 80. From eight to 80. And we love every single one of them. And, and when, we're, when we're writing a record, those are the, that's who we're thinking of. We're not thinking of, of, of a gender or a color or anything else. It's just how do we take what we've experienced, what we have in here, put it in there so human beings can enjoy it. So um, there wasn't a conscious thing about having like, you know, oh, we're gonna have a woman in this video, and we're gonna have a guy in this video, or in my head it's this guy in a chair in a room. It's just a person in a room in a chair. And they're going through this and they're living this. And that's what I meant earlier when I said that they're in every single one of these stories and every single one of these songs, you're all gonna be able to find something in these songs that you can take and and, and own and hold and it's tangible, you can make it yours. Um, you're, you're taking you know, pieces of our life and, and, and taking ownership of them. So that's, that's what I think about. Well, I think I got through about maybe a quarter of my questions. But We're talkers, <laughs> so, man. No, no, it's, it's great, it's fantastic. Keep going, Brad, keep going. But I, now I really, I sort of want to open it up and, and let all the, some of these people here that came tonight uh, to ask a couple of questions, you know? So um, I'm gonna have Laura come around. If you have a question, you're gonna raise your hand and Laura will come around and, and, uh, and uh, include you. Calm down, sir, calm down. Oh, we're gonna get to some, so to some music, but let's hear from our audience. Here. Settle down, you in the back. <laughs> All right, so, um, first two songs, you know, I really relate to them a lot because, you know, as someone who, um, who has dealt with depression and, you know, you know, has been very close to the end, you know, I can, re I really, I'm starting to see the journey from it and, you know, I'm really excited to hear this record all together. So my question to you is, um, while writing this record, were any, like, old wounds opened up? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's what it was. The question is, when we were making this record, did we uh, did we have to open up old wounds to 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 get uh, to get the end result and and that's that's all we did really because um, this is the first record that and I'm so proud I'll, I might get emotional I'm gonna try not to it's the first record that Brent Smith has written sober ever <laughs> but here's the thing it's probably the most dangerous record he's ever written lyrically and the most uh, uh, thought-provoking record he's ever written lyrically. And that came from doing exactly what you asked about, which is, hey, is it okay to, to talk about these things? Well, it absolutely is. And you talked about depression, and that all started from a song called Get Up, which I think we're gonna play with. Yeah, we're gonna play, we're gonna play it. Um, <laughs> but uh, Brent, had, I'd had this music, Brent and I'd worked on, on, uh, on this, this, this tune for, for a while, and we had the music done, the melodies done, and he's like, well, I'm gonna go work on the lyrics. And a few days went by and he didn't show up at the studio. We talked to each other every day. He's like, I'm not ready yet. You know, I'm not ready for it. And, and uh, finally he's like, okay, I'm ready to, I got something, I'm gonna bring it in. And he got in the studio and he sat down in front of me and he goes, I'm gonna be honest with you, I've had this for about five days. <laughs> um, but I was nervous to play it for you or nervous to sing it for you. He's like, because I wrote it about you. I wrote it about your depression. And uh, it was extremely personal to me for him to do that. And um, we finished the song and we finished up whatever lyrics needed to be capped off. And, and when we were done with it, it was, that song made it okay to write the rest of the record. It made it okay to, uh, to write a song like Devil, where, which addresses his addiction issues at, at rock bottom. And so um, all this record was, was, was opening up the emotional floodgates, yeah. if you will. You know, it, it's, uh, there's a song in the middle of the record called Dark Side, which we haven't really talked about a lot in any interviews, but that song is literally about opening up your, your brain and inviting someone into this twisted world that you've got up here. And uh, th there's just a lot of that on this record. It's very, uh, it's, it's all open wounds, basically. Great, great question. Hey, man, I'm glad you're dealing with everything, too. Take one more right here. Come on down. You guys are awesome, by the way. 
Thank you're you. awesome. Hello. I saw you at Tampa Friday night, by the way. You guys oh, thank awesome, you. man. Thank Did you. we do okay? Oh, you're amazing. Well, thank you very much. So, a question. So, with um, the song Enemies, was it kind of an impetus to, like, a beginning to this album? Because there's so much in that about how you guys kind of deal with each other and deal with, you know, with all the fame and all of the things that come down. And, you know, and, and obviously, each of us have addictions, obviously, and they're not necessarily the same, as you said before. We all fight our demons. So when you, when you kind of, that song to me kind of turned something for a lot of you because you came to, like you were saying, the end of your tour. You had so much fame. You had so much this, and then it went. So how did that impact your new album? I think that how it impacted was experience. And to be very blunt and bold, I, and I'm not trying to bring the mood down by any means whatsoever, but living through it, if you know what I mean. Like, when I think of where we were with enemies, and that was on the Amarillo cycle, um, we were, I think we were really open at that time also, like, I think that the media had an idea at that point in time what this band was. And all we wanted to do was be genuine and honest and forthcoming. Remember when we talked about doing that video, there were totally different concepts that were way more expensive. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, and then the director that we worked with at that time, Darren Doan, who's done a lot of our videos uh, in the past, he took us, I remember we were in Connecticut and he had this idea and it was about just stripping all the bells and whistles away and actually from a serious but also kind of comedic side like because it's a heavy song it's an intense subject matter but it was like don't take yourself so seriously you know what i mean like learn to have a little bit of a give here and there um so i mean with that particular video and that particular song and where we are now look i'm the last person to tell anybody to Go out there and try to cheat death, because death will win. And, but I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this. I have been clean since, um, I'm about two years in, March 1st. Thank you. I remember where I was, and we were starting um, touring cycle for for Threat to Survival. I'm in a hotel room, and I'm kind of just doing the quintessential what you do when you're an addict. You know, this is your last drink, your last drug, whatever you. I'm gonna be able, straight up with y'all. And I remember waking up from the night before, and this was March 1st. So I'm waking up from the prior evening. And I go into the restroom, my hotel room, and I look at myself in the mirror. And I had what happened, uh, I call it getting your bell rang. So I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and all of a sudden, I just remember my head, it literally felt like someone out of nowhere, just cracked me in the head with like a hammer. And I saw stars, and I remember falling on my knees and holding on to the, the counter. And I didn't see, I didn't have an epiphany. I didn't have, you know, a visitor. There wasn't an angel behind me or anything like that. But what I did have was this. I could feel an energy pick me up and stand me up and I was looking at myself in the mirror, and it, that energy didn't say anything to me, but it let me know, that's it. You've used them all. So if you decide to fall again, that's on you. And it was this acknowledgement of, you know, I, I got another opportunity, and, but I'm aware that I have so much more to live for. I'm no good to my son dead, you know what I mean? And I'm no good to these guys if I'm not here. 
And, and, the only, and the only reason I bring this up, because you asked the question about you know, that song and, and that time and where we are now, I take that moment with me. I don't always think about it, but I'm not invincible. You know what? None of us are. And I think if there was ever a moment in my life where I was being disrespectful to not only the fact that I'm alive and I'm able to do what I love, I know that 100% now I would, I would never disrespect that ever again. That's some profound shit, my brother. <laughs> Anyways, on, on that, I think what we'll do is we should play some music. Yeah. Oh, hey. uh, you guys are in for a real treat tonight because they're going to play four songs that a lot of people have not heard before. And maybe one that you have. Some new maybe songs. One. Anyways, so uh, we're going to take a bit of a break. Just a, just a second. Just enough to get set up and everything. You guys will hang around, right? We're going to take a break and set up the instruments. These guys are going to play, and uh, we'll see you in a bit. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys. Give it up for Brad Give from Max Story right here. Come Round of applause. Come on. Shine down. All right. Let's put this together. <laughs> <laughs> 